Hello everyone, this video is on the surprise space and living in a place which is spontaneous and out of the mind space. And sometimes we can just pick up on what other people want us to do or what our culture deems is possible or not possible or what our friends suggest for us to do. And it, the list just goes on and on and on. And it's really important when you have all of that noise to learn to settle and to enter some inner silence and to exist in between those belief systems or those thoughts, to come back to an inner knowing of what might be right for you. And what is right for you is not going to be right for somebody else. And so we can't really advise other people. We All we can do is hold space for other people so that they can discover what would work for them from them inside themselves. And so working as a therapist, it's really interesting. I hold space for people to realize what's going to work for them, but I don't suggest that they have to do anything because in the spaciousness of the session or the listening space, I bring a light and they bring the book and the light shows what's written on their book. And what's written on your book is going to be different to what's written on somebody else's book. And only you can read the writing. And so nobody else knows what direction you should go in. Nobody else knows what's going to make you happy. Nobody else knows your unique design more than you know your unique design. And when we interact with people that are non-judgmental, that are compassionate, that are patient, that can just be spacious with us and bring that light, then we can figure it out for ourselves. Because a non-judgmental space is a light. A compassionate space is a light. A patient space is a light. And so if we're interacting with people, just notice the tendency of the mind to want to judge the other person, the tendency of the mind to want to be impatient or irritated or angry. And so, for instance, I like snakes. I'm from a Naga lineage, so that's right for me. It's not going to be right for many other people. Um... Snakes for me are gateways into stillness and they help me bring the light into situations. And so that's right for me. What is a gateway for you? What brings you stillness is going to be different. And so this video, I wanted to make it because I wanted to share how we can flow bring the light into situations and live our life with more freedom and spontaneity because sometimes we get so caught up in beating ourselves up, noticing when we haven't achieved our goals in a specific timeline or worrying about what other people think of us or whether we'll fit in in the group that we're in, in the environment that we're in, that we, we overlook this surprise space, this space where if we were to be fully ourselves unapologetically and listen to our inner guidance, how our life could change and how we might start interacting with different people. We might start having inspiration to do creative things which we wouldn't have had. And it, it is tricky because we are bombarded in the media by subliminal messages about 
what is okay, what isn't okay, how we should look, what we need to do with our life, how we need to get accepted. And so it can be difficult to tap into a really authentic space. But if we do, um, if we manage to do that, we will feel a real sense of freedom, a real sense of weightlessness and fun and openness. And it, it does dissolve a lot of stress when you're yourself. It takes a huge amount of energy to pretend to be something you're not or to try and people please. And you're not really aware of how much energy you're actually expending living a life to please other people until you stop doing it. And sometimes that can be frightening for some people to really be unapologetically themselves. And so my heart goes out to everyone. It's not easy. There might be a lot of thoughts and emotions in the process. There might be a saboteur in the mind. And that's just something that you have to witness and observe when it comes up. And we're all interconnected, so we all feel the need to fit in. We all can feel the need to please other people. We all can feel the need to dumb ourselves down or change. That's in the collective. And sometimes we have so many blind spots, we don't even realize that's what we're doing. And I really actually, I want to do a video on money because... There is a collective hypnosis around the acquisition of wealth and how that is linked to our happiness. And I do believe that, yes, it's more comfortable in life if you can afford to pay your bills and to eat nice food and to do the things you need to do. But... The energy of just wealth and growing wealth for the sake of it can become addictive and we can be given a lot of messages continually that we need to buy certain things and in buying those things that will bring us happiness or that we're not okay as we are and we need these credibility indicators in order to have the right to exist. We need a big house. We need a fancy car. We need to earn more money than our neighbor. We need to have X amount in the bank account for us to be worthy of knowing. And this is a subtle messaging that we can just notice. Wealth is okay, we can enjoy it, it's fine. But if our sense of self and worth is linked to it, that's bondage, that's misery, and the wealth controls you. And so you don't want to be a slave to that construct. And we all have this because it's, it's, it's part of a fight-flight response, a trauma response that we're not okay unless we can protect ourselves or get out of situations and we need money to be able to do that. And money buys us freedom and money buys us safety and security. And so the acquisition of wealth gets linked to that initial trauma response. And in a more surprise space, in a more magical space, we can learn to trust that if we are fully ourself and surrender our fears, that the universe and nature will take care of us. And we don't need to be afraid. We don't need to be protecting ourselves with all of this finance and financial acquisition, worrying about losing things and 
working ourselves up and judging ourselves if we're not earning enough or we don't have enough money to do what our neighbour has. And it's prevalent here in America. It's very, very, very active in the collective that you almost can't be spiritual here unless you're wealthy and you have a huge following and the acquisition of wealth is linked to enlightenment or spirituality, which is a deep, deep, deep misunderstanding or that you are more intelligent or knowledgeable if you have wealth, which is a deep, deep, deep misunderstanding. Wealth is just something separate. It's, it's just something, some icing on a cake, but you need the cake. And the cake is being your authentic self, finding the core of who you are without all the appendages of status or wealth or what you you believe you've done right or wrong in the past, your successes or your failures, beneath all of that, there is you, an essence of who you are. And once you connect to that, you will be supremely confident and you won't need all of these other indicators that your ego provides for you. And so supreme confidence, invincible confidence, comes from realizing who you are in your design at a very deep, timeless level. And that's what I really want for everyone to experience. And there may be a journey towards experiencing it because there's things that you might need to drop or notice. And once you've dropped them, then you'll be in more of a flow state. And you won't feel the need to kind of market yourself as much or push yourself or beat yourself up and just be and just see other people beyond their achievements and their failures and connect to each other at a deep, deep, deep level. And that's a beautiful space for us to develop into as a human species. And some cultures have done it um, in the past or even now some cultures do do that and they're very peaceful because of it. And so I really hope that we can stop judging other people, judging ourselves, be patient with one another as we rediscover who we are beyond what we have or what we don't have and return back to our natural state of calm. And I'm going to see if anything else comes up on this subject of being oneself and living in a surprise space. When we get in a flow state, we can follow subtle impulses. Subtle impulses to pick up a phone and call somebody. Subtle impulses to maybe go somewhere. Subtle impulses to do something that we didn't think that we were going to do. And... It's linked to intuition. I kind of feel like doing this right now. I kind of sense that that could be fun. Or I haven't spoken to that person in a while. Maybe I'll reach out to them. And we can't really hear those intuitive, subtle messages if we're rushing around or we're trying to keep up with everybody else and what they're doing, or we're stuck in our head worrying about how other people perceive us. But if we drop all that, then we can start to listen and to receive receive information 
And that information within the silence contains the keys to our happiness, to our lasting happiness, that is. And yeah, we can get short-term happiness through getting high or sleeping around or making a load of money and spending it or even like bickering with people. We can get a high, the ego can get a high by being nasty to other people. People get high from that. <laughs> even online, they, they love that. Um, but the lasting happiness is very different. It, it has really got nothing to do with the ego or with how we're perceived in the relative world. It comes from mindfulness, mindful living, silent practices, being in nature, treating oneself gently, eating good foods that are healthy, being with animals because they are always in a surprise space. They're always mindful. They don't need to learn this. And so if you're around them and they're always being fully themselves and they don't care what you think and they're completely authentic, you can pick up on that energy at a subtle level. And so keeping pets, going into nature is a really helpful thing to do. And I love being around snakes because they're in a permanent meditative state and they're always mindful. And if you watch them and the way they move, the decisions they make are highly intuitive. He puffs sometimes when he's excited and I can hear him puffing. Sometimes he will puff when he's angry too. So you have to be able to differentiate what the puffs mean. He's very interested and extremely happy to be out. And he's giving up his beautiful scent, which means that he's in a very good mood. And so when you're around animals and you're communicating with them, you have to be in that surprise space where anything could happen at any moment in time. He could change his temperament <laughs> and you have to be sensitive to that. Oh, there's a big hiss there. What's the matter? What's the matter? He kind of wants to just do his own thing. And so sometimes if I want to, for this video, keep him in a, a specific position, he'll do it for a while, but then he'll be like, like, I'm going to go where I want to go. You're not going to tell me where I'm going to go. And that's what we want for you. We want you to know where you need to go and not listen to anyone else. And he ain't going to listen to me. And I don't want him to listen to me. <laughs> so where do you want to go, Pendragon? Let's see where he goes. I, I predict he's going to go down to the table. Oh, are you going to go down to the table maybe? I think yes, he's going to go down to the table. And there he goes to scoot around the table.
And that's another thing I loved about Burning Man was back in the day, you didn't have any phones or any way of contacting the outside world. You never knew what time it was. If you had to meet up with somebody, you would just have to use your intuition. And then you'd have all these serendipitous moments where you would just meet the people you needed to meet at the time you needed to meet them. And so now we kind of rely on our devices a lot. So we lose touch with our ability to do that. But it would be wonderful if we could reconnect to that intelligence. And so I'll also pray for that. And in meditation, I do different lengths of meditation. I might do 20-minute meditations or I might do longer meditations. But I never use a clock to time myself. And when you don't do that and you you kind of just figure out when the 20 minutes is up or when the 45 minutes is up. You'll just intuit, oh, it's been that time. And then you'll gently open your eyes and you look at the clock and maybe the clock's over there in the corner. It's not an alarm and it'll be that time. And so we know everything within ourselves it's not outside of ourself. So even though we think we need a watch to tell us the time, we know the time. We're linked to the moon. We're linked to the stars. We're linked to the sun. Uh, every cell in our body is communicating with everything else in the environment. And so we can wake up that sleeping intelligence through meditation so that we know things and we don't need to rely on things that are external to us. And we also don't need to rely on other people to tell us what we need to do. We don't need to rely on anything outside. And there can be some trusted people that we do interact with that maybe can reflect some blind spots to us. But ultimately, if they do suggest blind spots to us, we always run whatever they're telling us through our own intuition again. And if we notice red flags, we drop it. And discrimination is the most important thing to have on the spiritual journey, knowing what to take, what information to take, and what to let go of. Otherwise, we just can get really confused. And so I pray that we can all reconnect to our intuition at a deep level and know who we are and live happy, successful lives, being our authentic selves.